Forty years ago, the global economy was forever changed. When people remember then-President Richard Nixon, most think of the Watergate scandal and the subsequent collapse of his political career. That may be the case now, but history may remember him quite differently 50 years from now. Our bet is that he will one day be remembered best as the man who took the world off the gold standard and started the greatest pyramid scheme in recorded history. The year was 1971. The Vietnam War was sapping American resources, inflation was at a 20-year high, and Nixon was facing a tough bid for re-election. Nixon was elected on a platform based mostly on his foreign policy agenda. Though he himself was known to have little interest in the domestic agenda, he did realize that voters tend to consult their checkbooks before showing up at the polls. With inflation at over 4.7 percent, Nixon knew action was needed to gain control of prices for the sake of near-term economic growth and his own re-election. In early August, the president met with his team of economic advisors at Camp David. On August 15, 1971, he announced temporary wage and price controls and ended convertibility of the U.S. dollar into gold. Inflation subsided for a time, Nixon won re-election, and the world's economy would never be the same. To understand the consequences of Nixon's decision, we have to look back, way back. The gold standard as we understand it today was the dominant fiscal force for the vast majority of recorded history. Starting long before the birth of Christ, the idea of valuing goods and services based on an amount of gold was the cornerstone of commerce for more than 98% of the last 2,000 years. Unlike modern fiscal standards and policies, the gold standard was not created. It arose naturally out of mutual free market agreement. Since gold was in limited supply and high demand, it was seen as a universal medium for value that could not be manipulated by one party in a transaction. For example, the year is 150 AD and I want to enter into an agreement in which I take one cow per month from your farm each month for the next year in exchange for my work. The problem is, I don't work on your farm. I'm actually a blacksmith at some other guy's farm, and thus I can't trade my work for your cows. What we need is a convertible medium for value. In other words, we need money. The catch, however, is that we need the money to have worth in and of itself. I have to pay you something that has real value. If I simply give you a note that says I owe you for a cow, that note is only as good as my word. If I disappear the next day, you're holding the bag. Since we both agree that gold has value and that its value is not something you or I can manipulate, it becomes the perfect medium for exchange. It becomes our money. We enter into a contract through which I pay you one ounce of gold per cow through the end of the year, and voila, a gold standard is born. That is free market economics at work. As the world's economy grew over time, the gold standard evolved with it. In the late 1800s, most nations operated on what's known as the classic gold standard. Under this system, nations fixed the value of gold to a specific amount of their local currency. In 1834, gold was pegged at $20.67 per ounce in the U.S., and there it stayed until 1933. In this system, international prices rose and sank together, regardless of the strength or weakness of each nation's economy. This is a crucial flaw in the gold standard from the standpoint of short-sighted governments and a great benefit from the standpoint of long-term stability. We'll come back to that later. Though the consequences of the classic gold standard were complex, it basically worked on the premise that currencies shouldn't really change in value relative to each other. Instead, it held that weaker economies should accumulate less wealth and stronger ones more. Today, currencies change in value relative to each other based on the strength of each nation's economy. This makes wealth relative, which under the gold standard it is not. The significance of this important difference will become more obvious as we continue on. During the classic gold standard period, the balance between imports and exports from country to country was maintained through what's called the price-specie flow mechanism. 
That's economists speak for, when our economy is booming, gold flows to us. When it's weak, gold flows away. Here's an example. Imagine we create some great new American product that everyone in the world wants to buy. Our economy is booming, and there are more goods and services being produced and made available to consumers. Since the value of the dollar is fixed to gold, we can't create more dollars without having more gold. As supply of goods increases and the number of dollars to buy them is unchanged, the price of those goods goes down. It's simple supply and demand. As prices here at home come down, people overseas want to buy our cheap goods, thus our exports increase. As our exports to other nations increase, they send us money, which under the classic standard is the same as gold. Thus, America sees an inflow of gold. As the amount of gold we hold increases, so does our money supply, and prices begin to increase as a result. Likewise, when our economy slows and prices at home increase, we buy more from overseas and our imports increase relative to our exports. In sum, it looks like this. Economic growth leads to more availability of goods, which leads to prices falling. Falling prices leads to exports increasing, which leads to gold flowing in. Gold flowing in leads to higher money supply which leads to prices rising, which equals equilibrium. Or, economic recession leads to less availability of goods, which leads to prices rising. Rising prices leads to imports increasing, which leads to gold flowing out to other nations. Gold flowing out leads to lower money supply, which leads to prices falling. And that equals equilibrium. In the end, what the gold standard did was create long-term price stability. Local economic growth created falling prices, which were then brought back up again by an inflow of gold. The problem, of course, is that governments don't have the ability to control how quickly and how smoothly the process works. The gold standard, for all its simplicity and stability, does not necessarily fit the time frame of electoral cycles and short-term political goals. Before the shot heard round the world that started the Great War, the global economy saw a long period of growth and prosperity. That all changed quite quickly as World War I began to drain economic resources throughout the developed world. Nations faced with rising expenditures and a lack of tax revenue suspended their currency's convertibility to gold. Many saw extremely high inflation during war years and went back on the gold standard in 1925 attempting to curb rising prices. The problem for European governments was that the gold flow mechanism didn't work fast enough to reach price equilibrium before the onslaught of the Great Depression. As the global economy faltered in the early 1930s, governments around the world began to realize that they wanted to increase the money supply in order to drive down interest rates and spur economic growth. The idea was that if only money were cheaper to come by, it would encourage investment and growth through inexpensive borrowing. With a fixed money supply as a feature of the gold standard, central banks had little power to lower interest rates in attempts to create short-term growth. The UK was the first to leave the gold standard in 1931, and much of the world soon followed. There was one saving grace, however. The United States, the issuer of the US dollar, maintained its convertibility to gold. After the Second World War, nations around the world were again destitute with inflation raging and little infrastructure to produce growth. One exception was the U.S., which, relatively speaking, was left enriched by the munitions trade during the first part of the war. As England dumped the majority of their gold into the pockets of U.S. arms producers, the massive imbalances created were too great for the gold standard to correct quickly enough. Thus, the Bretton Woods Agreement was born. Under the new agreement, a new international currency system was created in which foreign currencies were convertible into dollars, which were then convertible into gold. This enabled nations to create flexible fiscal policy and manipulate interest rates to spur growth, while the U.S. dollar anchored the system with its gold convertibility. 
As time passed, the U.S. dollar became the world's reserve currency. This happened partially because of the strength of the U.S. economy and partially because of the dollar's convertibility to gold. Foreign governments began to buy and hold U.S. dollars instead of gold as a main storage for wealth. At the time, it didn't matter because the dollar was, quite literally, as good as gold. The rest of the world prospered because central banks could artificially stimulate local economies and fan the fires of economic growth. The U.S. prospered because, as the issuer of the world's reserve currency, we could borrow money at almost no cost from the rest of the world. As everyone wanted to hold our dollars in treasury debt, it was as if the world had handed Uncle Sam a credit card with no borrowing limit and basically no interest rate. In the end, money, which used to be in limited supply, was now virtually free for the entire world. The linchpin that held it all together was the simple fact that everyone knew the U.S. dollar could be traded in for a fixed amount of gold at any time. Then came the Vietnam War and our old friend, Dick Nixon. On August 15, 1971, Nixon announced that the mighty U.S. dollar could no longer be converted into gold. One would think that the whole global economy would have collapsed overnight when people realized that their local currency was no longer backed by anything other than a government's word that it had value. It didn't, at least not overnight. There was global price instability and inflation through the rest of the decade, and gold appreciated more than 2,500 percent in less than 10 years. Even so, the global system didn't collapse, but it did slowly and unmistakably begin to change. Since none of the world's currencies have been backed by gold over the last 40 years, they have all depreciated in value significantly. The last four decades have, by all accounts, been the most intensely inflationary period in recorded history. Even the dollar, which has fared better than most, has lost over 80% of its value since 1971. The catch, however, is that governments have been able to artificially create economic growth such that it has, for the most part, kept up with inflationary pressures. In other words, when economies falter, governments are free to print money to prop them back up. At first glance, one might say, so where's the problem? If economic growth is strong enough that people earn more money as prices go up, what's wrong with that? we fixed the short-term price instability that the gold standard brought, and balance is now reached through government intervention in the currency markets. Though it's an oversimplification, that's exactly what happened. At least, that's what happened until very recently. In 2008, it all changed. The problem with the new system of inflation and artificial growth is that it discourages saving and encourages borrowing. Think about it. If you know your dollars are going to be worth less tomorrow than they are today, why save them? Buy what you want, because you know you'll be able to buy less tomorrow with the same dollars. Better yet, why not borrow money now to buy even more? If your dollars are going down in value, your wages increasing and prices are on the rise, it makes sense to borrow money today. When you borrow, you'll buy goods at today's low price. When the price increases, the dollars you borrowed will be worth less and it will take you less work to pay them back, right? Doesn't that sound like what happened with the mortgage industry here in the U.S.? The only problem with this system is that it makes it nearly impossible to save money. Now, instead, you have to invest and earn returns to keep up with the falling value of money. Remember our parents' parents. Was wise investing a virtue for them? Maybe, but it was probably not nearly as important as saving money. That's changed today, hasn't it? Nowadays, it's widely expected that your savings account is not the majority of your net worth. We all buy stocks, real estate, and other assets that produce returns. We have to do this, or inflation will slowly erode the value of our savings. Say goodbye to cash under the mattress, and hello to 401ks, investment banks, and big money on Wall Street. Throughout the 80s and 90s and most of the last decade, this system brought unprecedented prosperity to most of the world. The problem, of course, is that it's nothing more than a pyramid scheme. For 40 years, money has been virtually free both here and abroad, this has encouraged borrowing on all levels. 
Citizens have borrowed from companies to buy goods. Companies have borrowed from banks to loan money. Banks have borrowed from citizens and governments to finance the whole mess, and governments have borrowed from anywhere they possibly can. The whole thing works because of the world's confidence in the U.S. economy and our government's ability to make good on our debts and prop up the world's reserve currency. In a sense, we have borrowed from other countries, allowing them to create cheap money and continue the borrowing bonanza. That's all fine and dandy until someone stops believing in the system, or rather, stops believing in the dollar. Pyramid schemes tend to run well while there is an ever-increasing amount of money coming in. New money flowing in pays the bills to the old lenders, and everything moves along quite nicely. That is, until the money stops flowing in. Then it all falls apart. Let's go back to our deal concerning the cows from your farm. I want to buy them, but instead of giving you gold, I'm going to give you an IOU. The note would state that instead of giving you one ounce of gold for each cow, I would give you three ounces. The catch is that I need to take your cow in advance and go sell it to another guy for four ounces of gold so I can give you the three I owe you. Then you ask, how are you going to find someone to buy this silly old cow for four ounces of gold? I reply, it's simple. I'm going to tell him to loan me one of his cows, which I will then offer to someone else for five ounces of gold using the same method to get the third farmer to agree. If you had any sense, you'd tell me to take my gimmicks elsewhere. As soon as one farmer doesn't agree to the deal, the whole plan falls apart. In a sense, that's exactly what happened when the real estate bubble burst in the U.S. three years ago. The whole world relies on the dollar as the storage place for wealth. The system worked because the U.S. economy has been so large and so strong that it represented stability in and of itself. The U.S. economy, in a sense, fulfilled the role that gold has played for thousands of years. People could buy dollars and save them, knowing that they would never be worthless because the U.S. economy was so strong. The problem was that the U.S. economy has become an economy of debt. With interest rates low, money available and the government propping up economic growth, consumerism in the U.S. grew at a staggering pace. Soon, everyone bought a home. Home values went up indefinitely, loans were easy to get, and real estate became the great American investment. The problem was, one day, one farmer decided not to buy the cow, and the entire system collapsed. Investors stopped buying mortgage-backed securities, the money stopped flowing and the pyramid came down. As the world's economy started to unravel in 2008, the U.S. government did what other governments have been doing for decades. They borrowed, borrowed, and borrowed some more. The government's solution was to borrow like crazy and stimulate the economy, relying on future growth to pay the bills. This has been made possible by the fact that the dollar is still the world's reserve currency. Though investors are losing confidence in the dollar at an alarming rate, they simply don't have much in the way of other options, at least not yet. The truth is that markets correct themselves, no matter how much governments try to intervene. The folks in Washington have been able to slow the deterioration, raise the debt ceiling, bail out the banks, save some homeowners, fight two wars, and get themselves re-elected again and again and again. What they can't do, however, is save the dollar. By pursuing these policies, they're destroying the one mechanism that makes the whole system work, the world's confidence in the U.S. dollar. We are already starting to see the cracks appearing. Just look at the price of gold. Remember that gold was at $35 per ounce when Nixon took us off the gold standard. On August 15, 2011, the 40-year anniversary of that day in 1971, gold was at $1,770 per ounce. That means that gold has appreciated in value by more than 5,000% in just four decades. Actually, that's not really true. It's not as though there is less gold today than there was in 1971. It's just that it takes much more work much more money and many more cows to buy that same ounce of gold. Gold hasn't actually increased. Everything else has gone down. 
Four decades is not much time. That's not even a full generation. When you plan for your future, is it possible you need to think another 40 years down the road? If not, won't the economic landscape of the world matter to your children in 2052? The point is that if this current trend continues, the Great Pyramid Scheme will keep on robbing the end user. The end user, of course, is you. The only course of action left for private citizens is to take the situation by the horns and stop buying the cows. By holding U.S. dollars through this mess, we're effectively saying, sure, we believe this bill will hold its value, even though we've seen it do nothing but go down for the last 40 years. In a sense, we have to get back to the basics. We live in a world where the idea of investing must be replaced with the idea of saving. We live in a world where saving can't really be done by holding currency. Thankfully, we live in a world where we have the freedom to make our own choices, at least for now. It's no wonder more and more investors are flocking to gold. It's really the only way out of this great pyramid scheme. Some folks say gold's in a bubble, but bubbles are the result of an artificially inflated sense of value. Over the long haul, gold is value and thus doesn't artificially inflate. Even for those who bought gold in January of 1980, when it was at its previous all-time high, this simple fact holds true. Today, they have more than doubled their money, while the dollar has done nothing but fall apart. Like it or not, this is the new reality. Like it or not, gold may be the only option. The global economy can't go on booming forever on borrowed money, and the other shoe will drop. All we can do as individuals is protect ourselves and make sure none of us is the last farmer to buy the cow.